Hello, and welcome back to another edition of 10 Buck Test Bench, where today we're going to go through and do a proper alignment of our 7 transistor radio here. We're going to align the IF strip, we'll align the oscillator, we'll align the antenna tuning. When we finish, the receiver should be able to tune correctly to both ends of the band from uh, 1605 kilohertz or 1.605 megahertz down to 525 kilohertz and those two points should appear at the ends of our tuning capacitor. The other day when I did an alignment I did a quick oral alignment I didn't spend a lot of time we got the radio up and running and it was functional. Today we're going to take the time to do it correctly and we should be able to net this in at both ends of the frequency band so that it has the proper coverage. We're going to start our alignment with the IF or intermediate frequency. What you say is the intermediate frequency? Well, in your typical AM receiver, we'll take a look at VernCAD real quick here. In your typical receiver, and why is that showing up upside? Oh no, it's okay. Sorry, <clears throat> I got distracted by the viewfinder here. The receiver, let's say for example we want to receive a signal on 610 kilohertz. There's a local oscillator in the receiver. This transistor right here that tracks as our tuning capacitor tunes the front end or the antenna circuit. It's also tuning this oscillator. So our incoming signal is peaked here mixed with an oscillator which is tuned here they're mixed through this coil fed into the trans back into the transistor and into our first IF transformer at 610 this is a down converting receiver and I'll explain or, or show you how I I, I can prove that to you later most simple AM receivers are what they call down converting receivers. That is, the local oscillator operates at a frequency above the frequency of interest. In our case, our frequency of interest, for example, is 610 kilohertz. And the reason I picked that is we have a local broadcast station here that's very strong in that frequency. 610 kilohertz, that means our local oscillator will be operating at a frequency of 1,075 kilohertz. That will mix and produce two additional frequencies. It will produce the 465 kilohertz intermediate frequency, and way out of the band it will also produce a 1,685 kilohertz. The local oscillator will mix with this signal and produce two signals, an upper signal and a lower signal, an up converted and a down converted. We don't care about the 1685, that will be well outside the pass band of our intermediate, un, yeah, easy for me to say, our intermediate frequency filter. These are always called intermediate frequency amplifiers and they are amplifiers, they are also filters the very front end of the receiver this portion of the capacitor and this large portion of the coil form a resonant circuit to roughly tune in our frequency of interest but it's probably about 30 kilohertz wide it's a very wide broad tuning front end if you've ever played with a crystal radio a crystal radio is basically nothing more then this first coil right here in parallel with the tuning capacitor ignore the trimmer for now just look at the main C1 in this coil with the addition of a diode detector and a set of headphones and a small capacitor you have a radio you add an antenna you add a ground you have a coil and a capacitor and you've probably noticed that when you're listening to a crystal radio you can hear two three sometimes four or even five stations at the same time because the tuning here is extremely broad but it's good enough to help peak the signal a little bit now here in the United States 
we have 10 kilohertz spacing. They call it channelizing or channel spacing between AM broadcast stations. However, they will never put a 620 or a 600 in close proximity to a 610. They're spread around the country and they try to separate them as much as possible. The reason being, they restrict the audio bandwidth of AM to between roughly, let me, whoops, I'm almost out of frame here, to roughly between 40 hertz to 5 kilohertz. That's a 5 kilohertz audio bandwidth. However, when that audio mixes with our carrier frequency, it's going to produce a signal 5 kilohertz above and 5 kilohertz below, or about 10 kilohertz wide. Hence the 10 kilohertz spacing. Hopefully, they won't interfere with each other too badly if they separate the stations. Now, the front end tuning of the receiver, as we said, is very, very broad. It's going to be very wide, and it's probably only going to have about a 30 kilohertz at best bandwidth, or uh, it's only going to restrict to about 30 kilohertz at best. It's probably even worse than that. But it will peak our signal somewhat on this coil so that there's enough signal voltage to mix into the oscillator and end up with our IF. Then we will get into our, is this still in frame? Yes, we'll get into our first IF transformer or filter. That will probably restrict the bandwidth down to about 20 kilohertz at its 3 dB points. And its 3 dB points mean that's where the signal has, strength has been cut in half. At 3 dB down, you've cut the signal in half. So the 3 dB points, our center of our tuning would be here and we'll have about a 20 kilohertz bandwidth in the first IF. It's going to be very broad. We go into a second IF filter. That helps to make the skirts or the edges of the filter a little bit steeper, probably bringing it down to about 15 kilohertz. Now we're starting to get some selectivity out of our radio. We're narrowing down the amount of signal that can be heard or the, the amount of bandwidth that can be received and it starts rejecting adjacent channels. Remember these up here are very close. Even though they might be far away, they would be able to bleed in here, they'll be able to bleed in here, and probably even here a little bit. By the time we get to our third IF filter, hopefully we can bring our bandwidth down to about 10 kilohertz. Now these are rough figures. It could be 12 kilohertz, you get below 10 kilohertz, audio quality starts to suffer. Even at 10 kilohertz, music will suffer because most stereo systems are easily capable of going up to oh, 18, 20 kilohertz. The top end ones might go up as far high as 25 kilohertz. Even though you can't hear it, it makes for a flatter response. <clears throat> Shortwave receivers will reduce this even further. A sideband transmitter will probably reduce, the receiver rather, would reduce this down to about 6 kilohertz. Morse code uh, receivers or CW receivers will reduce this down as little sometimes as 250 hertz. Extremely narrow bandwidth. You couldn't understand any speech at that bandwidth, but it's good enough for receiving Morse code. And it rejects all the noise on either side. But on a typical AM radio like this one, it probably never gets any tighter than about 10, kil 10 to 12 kilohertz by the time we get to the third IF. Good enough for adjacent channel rejection, but wide enough to give you decent audio quality. And the reason you hear mostly talk radio on AM these days is because of the restricted bandwidth due to this 10 kilohertz channel spacing you don't get real good fidelity out of an AM radio, where with FM broadcasting they have a much wider bandwidth and off the top of my head it's somewhere between 15 and 20 kilohertz. I don't remember the exact number. Sorry, I should have looked that up beforehand. <clears throat> so, what we have to do is adjust our local oscillator after the IF is done so that we can tune down to 525 kilohertz by producing a local oscillator of 990 kilohertz 
Then we'll swing to the top end of the band and we'll adjust this trimmer capacitor on the high frequency end so that we can get our local oscillator to 1530 kilohertz so we can receive 1065. Remember, 465 kilohertz IF offset. And when we're all when all is said and done, when I tune to the 525 portion with my signal generator, I should be able to receive 525. The local oscillator should be at 990. Turn my signal generator up to 1065. My local oscillator should be at 1530, and I should be able to re, uh, receive or hear the 1065 signal here. So let's get on with it. For today's lab, we're going to be using our signal generator from Accurate Instruments Company. This will be our uh, signal generator. We're going to use our Heathkit frequency counter to accurately set the signal generator. Now back in the day, they would not have had a signal, uh, excuse me, a frequency counter. They would have merely used the graduated marks on the signal generator. And in reality, it's kind of close enough. The IF section of these receivers is pretty forgiving and you can usually net the oscillator up or down in frequency, the local oscillator up or down a, a few kilohertz to match whatever error you tune the IFs to. But today we'll go for accuracy. We'll go exactly at 465 kilohertz. Now ignore the 60 hertz over here. The IF section is not even going to be aware of that small uh, frequency error and we simply can't get these simple signal generators any tighter than that. If you try to tune it any more I'll probably jump well below Yeah, I'm 30 down now. Now I'm really high. Now I'm 70 hertz. I'm just going to call that close enough. These signal generators never had great accuracy. However, it is more than accurate enough to tune the IF section. Again, we've got a fair amount of bandwidth in these coils. This is what was used for years and years and years, and you never had any trouble with your AM radio. For our indicator of proper tuning, to give us an indication, we're going to show you three different methods. The traditional method is a vacuum tube voltmeter, and our DeVry Institute transistorized voltmeter is going to substitute for a VTVM. My VTVM is three times wider than this piece, and this has the same input impedance. So this is our surrogate, if you will, VTVM. A transistorized uh, analog meter is just as good as the VTVM, just as sensitive and just as high impedance. So that'll work fine. We will also show you using the ICO signal tracer. We will use the tuning eye as an indicator of peak tuning. Last but not least, we'll use the oscilloscope back here in the background. And the reason I prefer the oscilloscope is I don't have to listen to the volume levels necessary to get a good reading on either one of these instruments. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. So let me get set up and okay. we'll get started. The signal generator is set to 465 kilohertz. I am injecting it into the oscillator transistor merely to isolate it from the rest of the receiver from the IF chain. This way the IF chain is seeing its correct impedance. And I'm going to increase the volume and bring the level up. And you can see by the time I get an indication here on the meter we have a fairly annoying whine going on in the background. However, this is how it was done for years. You could disconnect the speaker or put an additional potentiometer in series with the speaker to reduce the volume, but you should always be listening to the signal so that you're sure you're tuning to the signal generator and not some random noise pickup. I'm going to start by tuning the last IF coil here, and you can see on the meter that one was actually pretty close. We're going for maximum voltage coming out of the demodulator. 
Try the next IF transformer. There we go. We're starting to make some real gains. I'm going to reduce the volume so that we don't saturate. I'm also going to reduce the power on the signal generator. As we get closer and closer to tune, we want less and less signal going in. Oh, you can see the gains we made by doing that. I'm going to turn it down some more. I'm turning down the signal generator, by the way, not the volume. That's a peak there. And again, another peak here. You can see I'm making improvements every time I reduce the signal level. So that's using the voltmeter method. Now I'm going to hook up to the ICO signal tracer. Okay. You can see the tuning eye on the signal tracer. Now this is going to get annoyingly loud, so I'm not going to be doing this for long. But if this is all you have available, this will work. And as I tune, you'll be able to watch the tuning eye close up as the signal strength increases. Now, you may say, why don't I just listen to the volume? That works to a point, but when you start getting down to the last couple of dB of tuning, in other words, tuning this thing for its maximum sensitivity, the human ear won't be able to detect the difference reliably, where a tuning indicator like this eye or the voltmeter will. Now we'll go to my preferred method because I can turn the volume way down. Okay, with the volume turned way down, and you can just probably hear it in the background, now I can go in here and adjust my IF transformers, and I'll just keep lowering the volume and lowering the signal generator. I can start really fine-tuning without the annoying whine being overpowering. This is the beauty of having an oscilloscope. However, as you saw, the voltmeter works just fine. And the tuning on this first IF, oh, there we go. There's the first IF. And we'll go back and do the second. And you can see the peaks going up and down, but there's hardly any discernible difference in the volume. And this is why a tuning indicator such as the voltmeter or the oscilloscope is so important. If you want to maximize the tuning on this, you need a visual indication of some kind. And we're still getting improvements. I'm going to turn the signal generator down some more. And just to finish up, I'm going to go back. Okay, to we've zoomed in on the voltmeter. And if you can stand the wine, you can see the voltmeter gives us a very clear indication of the tuning peak. Go back to the second IF. Go back to the first. And I'm finding that this one, as soon as I relax pressure on the core, it drops back down. So the core is a little bit loose. Go back to the last IF. And I'll keep doing this back and forth until I cannot realize any further improvement. Now this is going to work fine for this AM radio because it's fairly broad. Now, this one's tough because every time I touch it, just touching it, moves the core. There we go. Okay, turn this annoying whine off. If you were tuning a two or a double or triple conversion receiver, there are often procedures for broadening out or flattening out the top of the IF response curve. In a later video, we'll show you how to do that on this radio. But that requires either a sweep generator and an oscilloscope, 
or a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator and that's what we'll be using here is a tracking generator and the uh, spectrum analyzer. Beyond the scope of this simple radio, this simple radio does not require that kind of tuning and in fact you're not really going to realize much of a gain. It's only for narrower band shortwave receivers where you're trying to accurately control the bandwidth. And uh, so we'll zoom back out here and I see the meter is still in the field of view so that's good. Okay we have our IF netted in. Now we're going to try to bring the local oscillator in correctly and we're going to try to get both ends of the band tracking correctly. So let me get right, the signal, our signal generator is now set for 525 kilohertz which is the published low end range of this receiver and at the low end of the range I'm going to try adjusting the local oscillator to see if we can find it. And that was it. Reduce the signal level. Where'd it go? Okay, I was over coupling and I've moved the signal generator lead. I've just clipped it on the insulation of this lead going into the tuning capacitor on the antenna side just to leak enough signal in. And you can see we've netted in 525 kilohertz. Now we'll go to the other end of the band and I am going to set my signal generator for the 16 or yeah 1605 kilohertz so let's bring it up there band B and there's going to be several response points on these whoops gone too far one two three four I wasn't paying attention here Gotta turn this up one five sixteen twenty sixteen. That's a little tough with this signal. Sixteen oh seven is close enough to start with because we're gonna have to go back and forth a couple times. Now I'm going to adjust the trimmer capacitor here on the oscillator to try to bring the high side in. Okay, we have 16.05, we go back down the other end of the band. Ugh. Quiet things down by turning that off. I'll go back to 525 kilohertz. That's a little time consuming, but with patience, we should be able to net this in. 525, trim my oscillator. Back up to the 1600. Wow, pretty close. It's supposed to be 1605, so it's off just a little bit. Trim that in. Go 
back down the other end. 525 again. Oops, got to change bands. Back up to the 1600 end. Every time we do this, we're getting closer and closer to having it precisely tuned. Tune check it one last time down at 525. Five twenty-seven, I think that's close enough. Now I'm going to adjust the antenna trimmer. And typically you do that on a strong broadcast station up near the low end of the dial. That's why I chose my 610. Devils lead one nothing on the goal by Mike Camilleri at 333 of this first period. See if we can get any improvement on the antenna tuning. Well, I came up. Leading to the Devils goal. Well, if you know Sidney Crosby, you know that that play rankles, and he's going to do everything he can. And that just about does it. No good for about eight feet. This way, you jinxed them again. Right to left out, Tony Parker. Eric and Nate Furniture with low every day, no half of what. Well, there you have it. It's evening, late evening here, so the broadcast skip is rolling in. So it's going to be hard to listen to anything clearly this time of night. There's so many overlapping stations. But our receiver is now tuned. We have 525 on one end. We have 1605 on the other end. Our IF strip is peaked for maximum uh, selectivity. The oscillator's netted in correctly, ready to rock and roll. Now in a future video, I will explain further about IF sections. I'll explain about oscillator sections. And again, we still have to come back and revisit this audio section. We're also going to take a look, as I said, we'll use the uh, spectrum analyzer with the tracking generators to demonstrate custom tuning the IF strip for a little more bandwidth. Again, not necessary on this radio. It's just to add to the knowledge base.
Hope somebody out there found this interesting. Hope it didn't run too long. And I'm trying to keep them short, but there was a lot of stuff to cram in here. I'm the Radio Mechanic. See you soon. And I nearly forgot an important piece. I had told you early on... Let me zoom back out here. That the local oscillator had to track from one end of the band to the other. And this is a down converting receiver, which means if I've aligned this radio properly at the top end of the band when it's receiving 1065, my local oscillator should be around 1530. Did anybody out there catch my math error? I hope somebody's paying attention. I am so dyslexic that when I get pulled over and I've been drinking and driving, they give me an IUD. The top end of the band I had written down 1065. It's 1605, 1605, not 1065, which means the local oscillator at the top end of the band should be 2070. I had the low end of the band correctly, correct, fortunately, 525. Now, I did align it to 1605, but for some reason, when I wrote all of this information down, well, I know why, I'm dyslexic, I wrote down 1065. If I've done this alignment correctly, I should be able to connect my frequency counter to the local oscillator tuned to this end of the band, and I should have a local oscillator reading of 990 kilohertz when I'm tuned to the low end. And when I go to the top end of the band, I should have a local oscillator of 2070. That's if I've did, done everything correctly with the signal generator over here that we just did. So let me see how well I did. Let me get set up here. All right. I've got my HP frequency counter. I'm leaving that one connected, the, the Heath kit connected to the signal generator. I've got my HP turned on, and I'm going to collect, uh, collect, connect this to the local oscillator output. And that shouldn't affect the frequency much. Get this guy out of my way. And I'm going to come up here and see if we can zoom in enough to read that other frequency counter. Sorry, can't get all of this in the frame at the same time. That looks like it's going to be readable. Now I'm going to turn the capacitor's full mesh where we should be receiving a 525 kilohertz. And let's see what the local oscillator is. 991. And theoretically it would be 990. I'd say that's about as dead on as this radio is going to get. Let's go up to the other end of the band and bury the tuning capacitor and uh, 1065 plus IF of 465 should be 2070 and that's 2072. If I tune back just off the edge a little bit you can see the frequency change. Whoops! Frequency change there is 2070 and it actually looks like there's a little anomaly right at the end of the tuning capacitor but that's not unusual either. We'll go back down to the low end of the band, 990.7, high end of the band, 2071. Now it's going to vary from time to time and this oscillator is going to drift, but if we're within a kilohertz on both ends of this, for this type of a radio, I'd say we've netted this thing in quite well. So that's really the final thing. I just wanted to show you the local oscillator tracking. And if I go to my 610, let me find my 610 station here. My 610 station should have a local oscillator. Let's see. If we take 610, well, here on the calculator, plus 465, should be about 1075. There it is. Uh, 
Unfortunately, there's all kinds of heterodynes there tonight because the skip is rolling in. But you just heard him announce 610. Ten seventy six within a kilohertz. Now I could probably go back and redo the IF strip and redo the oscillator again, but the IF is not going to care. This radio is tuned well enough to work from one end of the band to the other. With, with this type of receiver, you really won't see any improvement by playing with it anymore. Finally, I'm the radio mechanic. This time I really mean it. See you later. Bye.